Thanks all so much for being here with us tonight, Lauren. Thank you so much for inviting me to come and talk to you about your wonderful book, Art Monsters. Um, you, I believe, are going to set the scene for us. Thank you. Um, by giving a reading from the book. Um, from page 14. <laughs> Those of you who are reading along at home. Yes. Um, is um, this working? Can you all hear me? Yeah, okay, good. That is very, I can hear you very well. We um, are live. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is very topical, I think. <laughs> We're going straight in on Halloween to talk about um, the scary monsters <laughs> <laughs> in the book. Yeah, we were we got together for a little drink before this, and you know said you know, definitely there has to be a special Halloween scary reading. So this is the bit where I talk about monstrosity and try to rethink how we use the term and how it might help us open up some ideas around feminist aesthetics. So I am gonna just go right in. We're on page fourteen. Read along if you like. Uh, we tend to think of monsters as scary, outsized creatures hiding under the bed or in the closets. They are vast and unwieldy, says the OED, often hybrid creatures, part human, part something else. They are always surprising in their dimensions and potentials, typically in a frightening or upsetting way. The word itself carries a satisfying physical charge. You monster, like hurling a thunderbolt at someone. According to the teratologist, that is, theorist of monstrosity, uh, Jeffrey Jerome Cohen, we can understand a culture by what it calls monstrous. The monster stands for everything a society attempts to cast out. Monsters dwell at borders. You might even say the border creates the monster. Everything that is acceptable over here, everything that is not over there. But these lines have never been fixed. What is monstrous and what is not? The boundaries dividing evil from good, clean from unclean, human from animal, etc., are subject to debate, an invention of Western culture maintained since antiquity by male philosophers who have often labeled monstrous bodies that differ from that of an able-bodied white man. Book seven of Pliny's Natural History gives an accounting of the wondrous people to be found in different nations and their own unique habits and talents. The anthropophagi like to drink from human skulls. The abaramon have backwards facing feet. The ophiogenes can extract the poison from a serpent's sting with the touch of a hand. Each description takes the author and his own nation as the template for what is normal and casts the rest as monstrous. The word monster became a way of pointing to, explaining, and containing all manner of difference and excess. Women are an easy double for this kind of chaos. Our bodies are uncontainable, squishy, unreliable, unreasonable, mysterious, unknowable. In antiquity, philosophers used them to posit oppositions between good and evil, human and animal, normal and abnormal. Woman is a temple built over a sewer, said Tertullian. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Uh, in the Theogony, Hesiod described women as a beautiful evil invented by Zeus to punish humanity. A few centuries later, Aristotle elaborated on the relationship between monstrosity and the feminine. A monster is a mistake. A female is a deformed male, therefore, a female is a born monster. There are many monsters on the earth and in the sea, wrote his younger contemporary, the playwright Menander, but the greatest is still woman. Negative associations with the term monster come late in the OED's list of meanings. Before it is a person of repulsively unnatural character, or exhibiting such extreme cruelty or wickedness as to appear inhuman, which is definition five, and after it is a mythical creature, definition one, the monster is something extraordinary or unnatural, an amazing event or occurrence, a prodigy, a marvel, though the editors note this usage is now obsolete. In Strong's Greek, the monster is teros, wonder, marvel. 
Acts 2.19, and I will show wonders, terata, in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky vapor. In Latin, it comes from monstrare, to show, without forgetting that it also derives from monere, to warn. You monster, you marvel, you demonstration, you warning. By the Christian medieval period, monsters like angels functioned as messengers and heralds of the extraordinary, writes the theorist Susan Stryker, urging transgender people to reclaim words like monster, creature, unnatural, and to draw transformative and subversive energy from them. They serve to announce impending revelation, says Stryker, saying, in effect, pay attention, something of profound importance is happening. For St. Augustine, the monstrous is a sign of God's wondrousness, and distrust of the monstrous a sign of ignorance and intolerance. Might the art monster, then, derive more from this Augustinian sense of the monster as wonder, rather than the more punishing Aristotelian sense as something evil and deformed? Perhaps we might retain St. Augustine's open-mindedness without the trappings of Christianity, and nominate Chris Krauss, our philosopher of choice. In I Love Dick, Krauss describes the monstrous as the blob. And I quote, mindless swallowing and engorging, rolling down the supermarket aisle, absorbing pancake mix and jello and everyone in town, unwise and unstoppable. The horror of the blob is a horror of the fearless. To become the blob requires a certain force of will. The Krausian monstrous, Instead of making ourselves small, we allow our monstrous selves to grow unignorably large, unwise and unstoppable. If Adrienne Rich calls herself a poet of the oppositional imagination, perhaps the art monster is a poet of the absorbent imagination, the aggregative imagination. She is the thief, the collage artist, the collector, the weaver, the blob, whose mode of subversion is to overwhelm in an ars poetica of excess. I have the sense, writes the American artist Carolee Schneeman, that our best developments grow from works which initially strike us as too much. Such works have the effect of containing more than we can assimilate. They maintain attraction and stimulation for our continuing attention. We persevere with that strange joy and agitation by which we sense unpredictable rewards from our relationship to them. That's the end of the Schneeman quote. Aesthetics is born as a discourse of the body, wrote Terry Eagleton. And while I don't think he was thinking of feminist art when he said that, he's inescapably right. To be gendered female is to be caught between beauty and excess, made to choose. To be a monster is to insist on both. And I'll stop there. Thank you. That's such an incredibly rich passage. Um, I'm sure that there are so many threads within it that we will return to in the course of our conversation. But maybe to start, I wondered whether you could talk a bit about the genealogy of this book and why the figure of the art monster got its hooks into you and made you want to expand uh, in the manner of that passage is so expansive and it really I think shows how the book's desire is to expand definitions right and to go beyond the entrenched but yes writing a book about the Ulipo movement in the early 2010s and then Flaneurs and now this book I wonder if there's a through line of freedom or being interested perhaps in a certain aesthetics of freedom, but also if you disagree. <laughs> I'd love to hear about why, when, where the art monster do. Oh, that's such a good question. No one has made the connection between the Ulipo book and <laughs> this book, so thank you. Um, yeah, I, definitely Flaneuse to this book. I'm um, sorry, my child is calling me, but you know, if they keep calling, I'm going to have to pick up, but <laughs> just one, he gets a one, one or two time pass. Um, but yeah, the Flanus book is the one that I wrote right before this one, and I, I started this book 
with the idea that I wanted to keep thinking about women in public space. Um, that book was, of course, about women in the city and appropriating urban space to themselves. But I, I came away from that book feeling like I wasn't done thinking about ways in which women demand to take up space and modes in which they have done that. And because I'm a literary critic by training and uh, sort of art or cultural critic just by practice, um, art and literature seemed like you know, an ideal place to start. Um, I was also thinking a lot about Virginia Woolf um, at the outset because my um, thesis advisor in America had died right before Flanders came out. Um, her name is Jane Marcus, and she's a great Wolf scholar, and she was responsible for, um, not single-handedly, but she and a few other feminist critics in America were responsible for transforming our vision of Wolf from this kind of effete modernist snob into a really like engaged feminist socialist pacifist. And the way that they did that was largely through her book Three Guineas, um, which is a kind of pacifist screed against war and um, against the kind of patriarchal institutions that make war possible. Um, and so she's writing about feminism and war in that book in a way that people found very problematic and all of her friends hated it. Leonard was like, I really don't think you should publish this book. Um, after her death, you know, Ian e. Forster gave a talk in which he lauded her genius, but it's like, it's a shame about the feminism. That was <laughs> a stain on her work. Um, he actually called it, it spots, like, like a malady on her work. Um, and so I, I wanted to write about Wolf and Three Guineas and that kind of impulse to make art that people don't think you should, that, you know, the people that you love and trust. I mean, Leonard, like, for Christ's sake, like, Leonard was, like, you know, making all of her life possible. I mean, talk about an art monster. She didn't have to do anything for herself. Leonard, Leonard took care of all of it um, and her cook and her housekeeper. Um, but... Yeah, this sense that she had this vision and she was going to pursue it regardless of the cost um, really struck me. And so I was thinking originally that I was going to write some kind of cultural history of Wolf writing Three Guineas, and I was going to call it her war book because that's how Jane calls it in her introduction to Three Guineas. Um, and then, I don't know, this Jenny Offal idea of the art monster, which is where you know the term comes from, Jenny Offal's brilliant 2014 novel, Department of Speculation. Um, that idea just, it struck me the moment I read it in 2014 and it stayed with me in those middle, you know, middle of the 20 teens when um, Flanders was coming out and I was thinking about, you know, life as a working writer and what kind of life I wanted to make for myself and leaving academia and leaving a marriage and starting something new and getting pregnant. Just a lot was happening in my own life. And so I was just thinking obsessively about um, how, how we make our lives and how we make our art and the risks that we take to do those things, even to the point of, of um, alienating people who we'd rather stayed on side, but you know, if you got, if you, you got to do what you got to do, is what, what I take from Virginia Woolf. <laughs> That's great. Um, and I, I, I really like this idea of not being done with an idea, so to speak, and having, and feeling like there's another iteration of it maybe, or another way that it could be refracted because you 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 reference Flanners in in the book, which I like. You sort of say this was my argument in Flanners, and this is a kind of a continuation of it, but along different tracks and taking a bit of a different route. And I think there's this misconception that one when you're done with a book, you're you're done with it, or there's maybe also a need to distance oneself a little bit from it maybe, or maybe there's a slight relation. I don't know, the complicated affects of having written a book. And I thought it was really interesting how it was brought into the textuality of art monsters, or it's a book where the materiality of writing, and that was really interesting hearing you talking about the different things that were going on in your life and thinking alongside those events and 
Yeah, d would you agree that the materiality of what it takes to to make art and the texture of writing on a daily basis was an important strand to you within within this book? I think I think so, and some of that has to do with um, maybe this expectation that women writers are going to be writing about themselves or have to bring themselves into the frame um, in a way that when I was working on Flaneuse initially bothered me because it wasn't, the fact that that book, to come back to <laughs> Flaneuse again, um, is a blend of um, autobiography and cultural criticism or literary criticism um, was it came out in the chapter that I wrote about Jane Reese, but then that and that was the sample chapter that we were going out to publishers with um, for the proposal. And the editor at Chado, Parissa, who ended up acquiring it, said, "I really like the way that you're blending your life with the life of mm. Jane Reese um, and her work. Can you try to do that in the rest of the chapters? Make that something you carry through." Um, and so there was part of me that kind of bristled and was like, no, I'm just going to write about Virginia Woolf. I don't have to write about me in Virginia Woolf. Um, I get kind of tired of the like biblio memoir, mm -hmm. um, even in, you know, this is like 2013 or 2012 when I sold that book. Um, so even back then I was tired of the, the biblio memoir, like living my life by reading Virginia Woolf. Like um, it's fine and when it's done well, it can be great, but it just felt like a template that I was resisting. But so anyway, to fast forward to writing, Art Monsters, I was like, right, I'm not going to put myself in this book. This is just going to be about Virginia Woolf, Jenny Awful, and whoever else comes up. Um, and then it, I just kind of, it was like I had developed this habit of, put, of including myself in the frame, and I couldn't not. Um, and it, I mean, something that I do kind of, um, I don't know, I think there, there's something ethical about acknowledging the fact that you're not some objective critic standing back and uh, admiring a painting on a wall like you're there you're a body you've come from somewhere you might be hungry your feet are hurting you're like is there a place to sit down once I've looked at this painting like you're you're a, a physical entity engaging with the work of art and you know whether it's a book or a painting or something else um, and I think that there's something very important about recognizing that you're coming to the work with a particular background and a particular formation and a particular body, a particular way of being perceived in the world. Um, and that to pretend that that's not there is there's something dishonest about it. And yeah, I, I don't know, it, it so qualifies the way that we see that it feels like an important thing to point out. Yes, I think the phenomenology of criticism is can be a, f a, f a feminist thing very much to insist upon. And exactly as you were saying, the kind of material coordinates um, that bring a work into the world. Um, and you use a phrase, you use the phrase embodied criticism, I think at a certain point, which um, felt really resonant. And obviously the body is, and as we just heard in the in the reading, it's, it, it is, the protagonist of art monsters in in many ways or figuring the body or how to write the body how to how these artists that you that you constellate because there are so many voices in art monsters that not that that form a chorus with with your own um so two questions really i suppose one you call your corpus your monstrous network I believe <laughs> and <coughs> was that totally an organic process you said it's at uh, and in the beginning it was just going to you wanted it just to be about Virginia Woolf and Jenny Offal and <laughs> that was it <laughs> or 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 whoever else came up and was it a process of just who came up at the time in that in a sort of in a or was it more conscious I suppose that recruitment process of of this very wide ranging um constellation of 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 artists that you speak about it it was um a little bit of both there were a few people that i knew i wanted to get to like kathy acker struck me as a kind of quintessential um monstrous mm. figure mm -hmm. um certainly in the way that she crafted her persona, her public mm -hmm. persona, she was clearly trying to 
um, defy some kind or transgress in some way our expectation of what a woman writer should be and do um, and publicly affiliated herself with mm -hmm. um, a range of writers who were seen as, you know, the, the like, the bad boys of literature, like the Jean Genets of literature, uh, the Rimbaud. Um, and so I think, you know, consciously there was a sense of like having to get to people like that, but really it was just kind of a question of staying open to what crossed my path as I was starting to do the reading. So there was a big Carolee Schneeman show in Queens in New York City um, in December of 2017, which was when I was really starting to be thinking about this book and who was gonna be in it. And so I had an inkling, I knew some of her work and I thought maybe I'll go find out some more about Carolee Schneeman and was like, oh, wow, okay. This has given me a lot to think about. There's that amazing, um, film fuses, which was you know projected on this massive wall, like twenty five feet tall. This is a, a film that she made with her partner. That's very graphic. It like shows them having sex, um, engaging in certain sex acts, as well as a variety of you know she's there's like cows in a field and she's running on a beach and there's just a lot happening in fuses. Um, but it's the kind of thing that like you can get very uncomfortable <laughs> watching that in public um, with like you know, your art friends. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not the same thing as watching a sexy scene with your parents, but it's not that far off. Um, <laughs> <coughs> I'm trying to think, I knew, I mean, Kara Walker's um, A Subtlety had very recently been up in New York and it's almost like I was, you know, like swinging from branch to branch, like finding because I knew I was gonna write about Carolee Schneeman, that had me thinking about certain ideas about the body and then that would lead me to someone like Kara Walker who's got you know this, this massive like sphinx-like mammy made of sugar. And so what are, what are the kind of issues around um, slavery and American history and how, th how the body is asked to incarnate certain kinds of histories or certain histories are encoded into certain bodies. Um, there were just like thematic, strands that would come out of each work as I kind of encountered it and that would help me kind of build this network. So knowing I was going to write about Kara Walker, I started thinking about, you know, American history and black American history and, you know, then I'm like, well, Betty Saar, I feel like I've read, read something about her or heard a podcast about her, I better go check out what she's up to. And oh, actually it's really interesting to put these two women into conversation because they hate each other. Um, talk about monstrosity, like Betty Saar just has no time for Kara. I mean, not just has no time for her, like actively thinks she's doing bad things um, in terms of, you know, representing the black experience in America. Um, and Lubina Hamid, who's a, an, a British artist who I write about a little bit in the book, I've done some events with her, and she was like, I could not believe you were putting these two artists in conversation with each other. How did you find the audacity to do it? <laughs> and I was like, it was not audacity, it was stupidity, it was innocence, naivete, like I'm a writer, I'm not in the art world, so I didn't appreciate the degree to which it was, I mean, Lubena was like, I, Lubena is black and she's like, I cannot see Kara Walker's work, it makes me too uncomfortable, I can't, I can't accommodate it. Um, and so, I mean, she was like glad that I wrote about her in the book, but she was like, no, I have to draw a line. There's, you know, we can't, you can't just point to a black artist and say she speaks for black people. Like there's a very, there's, you know, complicated ideas around representation and storytelling and what can and can't be tolerated in an image. And it's not just a question of, y as I write about in the Dana Shoots chapter, a white artist venturing sh somewhere where she had no business going. It's also, you know, very real and lively debates, even for instance, among the feminists in the 1970s when in the Hannah Wilkie chapter, questions around how a member of the group is representing the group and possibly inviting um, negative sort of views on, on the group, if that makes any sense. No, it, it does, it does. And it's interesting to hear you speak to visceral reactions right and and because because when you write about fuses that work by Schneeman you write 
it's important it's impossible to be detached before this this work like one has to engage and we are very far away from Kantian distance right that they're that they're and Schneemann I think w insisted on on deconstructing that mind body split and as you write it becomes complicated when you are the critic and you're meant by according to some schools to to um, embody distance or and I'm wondering that's really interesting what you said in the sense that you don't see yourself as being in the art world and I'm wondering how f how far that idea or that construction of the art world was complicated for you or frictional for you or was something that you thought about when writing the book and was it useful for you to think that you weren't that you weren't immersed in it or within it or or that you were s you were outside of it looking in to a certain degree um that's a really interesting question i think um you know on one hand i was approaching writing about art the way that i write about literature or you know really anything any object that i would be considering in terms of dealing with it being attentive to it doing close readings tracking how i'm responding to it all of that kind of work and then um the kind of secondary research which you know you read what everybody said about it and then you read what everybody said about what everybody said about it uh, and then you try to situate yourself somewhere within all of that but what was different <laughs> about this book was that some of these people are alive and well and have opinions <laughs> and so some of them I, I would go to meet like Shotoba Biswas who is the subject of the chapter um, Housewives with Steak Knives um, who by the way that painting um, I sort of wish we could show you here but we can't um, so you have to google it google it now or google it later um, Housewives with Steak Knives by Shotoba Biswas is going to be in this big show at the Tate Britain opening I think in a couple of weeks called Women in Revolt, Revolt yeah. and so you can see it if you go to London um, it's magnificent it's a it's a sort of self-portrait of the artist as Kali the you know Hindu goddess of both destruction and creation um, and she has got like a big you know machete in her hand and she's holding um, the the decapitated heads of British colonialists in one in another hand um, and there's, there's like a Hitler type guy in there as well. Uh, it's there's it's just a it's an amazing overpowering image that she actually when she made it in the early 80s she had them hang it on the wall like so it was coming off a little bit so it was looming over viewers um, and then it was so upsetting to people apparently that one guy actually spat on it um, and you can see there's like a little spit stain um, and she wants it there she wants the record you know let the record show that someone spat on my painting. Um, and th it's made, it's painted on paper. Uh, she was an art student at the time, so she didn't have a lot of money. Um, and so it's paper and it, it gets rolled up and then unrolled every time it's shown. And Shitaba has decided like th she wants that, like that kind of evidence of the piece you know, being shown in the world and rolled up and unrolled again. She wants it to kind of register on the surface of the, the thing. So yeah, she's, she's an example of someone who you know, every time we would meet up to talk about this stuff, I would get like an hour long lecture on art history and all of the stuff that I was talking about and I would leave with pages and pages of notes. Um, so I had this kind of ongoing sense as I was writing of being in conversation with something that was still happening. Mm -hmm. And so I had to deal with that, you know, by kind of at a certain point drawing a circle around what I was going to talk about and having to leave everything else outside because otherwise, you know, I mean, this book took like, five years to do it was really a long um a long process and I think that's part of that is because I was staying open to come whatever came across my path and whatever should have told me in our meetings and um yeah but at a certain point you have to close the canon and be like we're done this this is the book <laughs> <laughs> yes that that leads quite well into a question I was I was thinking about as I was walking over here but 
in terms of how the book is so contemporary, both in its form and content, and the, the sort of unraveling in real time, the the sort of all of these all of these events and happenings from twenty I suppose it sort of from twenty sixteen onwards that it would have been when talking about art and women's bodies absolutely impossible not to acknowledge to some degree. Um, but then also a lot of a lot of the book I think gravitates too towards a specific period being the 1970s and performance art and women's performance art and feminist performance art of that time. And I wondered what about that particular decade or era was a rich scene in linking us to today, if, if at all. Um, yeah, it's funny. Um, when I was writing my PhD, it was like, at the time of the the like credit crisis, it was 2008. It was you know everything was was very very bad. It looked like we were going to go into a depression. And I was writing about the 1930s. Um, my PhD is in women's writing of the 1930s. Um, and so then during this book, and then looking back to the 70s, I was like, what? This is so weird. What's going on? Um, yeah, it was. I was writing at a time when you know this horrible horrible man had been inaugurated of, as president of my home country. Um, and I couldn't even bear to hear his voice. Like, I couldn't watch TV. <laughs> I had to really kind of protect myself from the onslaught of Trumpism, from MAGA America, and uh, I hope we don't have to relive that. Um, but yeah, there was just, you know, one thing after another, like from the pussy grabbing thing to the Women's March to, you know, the Brett Kavanaugh, um, the Congress, um, he was being, uh, sorry, I'm tired and I can't think of the word, when they were interviewing him to see if he was going to get to be a Supreme Court justice. Um, and Christine Blasey Ford, you know, gave her, her incredible testimony. Um, it was just like, and then, you know, capping it all off with the overturning of Roe versus Wade. It just felt like, um, you know, to say nothing of his many, many horrible practices, you know, the Muslim ban, the children in cages at the border, all of that. It felt like the body the female body, but the body in general, was under assault. Um, bodies that he construed as monstrous. Never mind that the man himself is like pure et dure, just a monster. Um, but all of us were the ones who had to be, you know, uh, monitored and surveilled and, and, you know, made captive of and controlled. And um, It was just a time of being very angry. And so the 70s, I mean, is it any accident that like women started making this amazing body art after the birth control pill became available and you know, after abortion was legalized in America, it was just a time when women were, you know, it was the beginning of this, you know, kind of parabola that we've just come to the end of. It was a time when women were taking control of their bodies and they were winning legislative victories and, you know, spreading the word of you know female liberation often through art and through being as Carly Schneeman put it both the image and the image maker um, of like really claiming the right to be to occupy both places um, and really um, examining the body or interrogating what the body could mean by putting their bodies in the frame so I'm yeah I think it it seems like the two go hand in hand. Yes. Um, this insistence on both, on a position of bothness, or another very interesting way I think that you formally um, perform that position is this idea of being across the slash or being inhabiting a position that is both image and image maker in Schneeman's case or or creation and destruction um, and I wonder whether there's also ambivalence in be in being in being both and how perhaps that's not always 
a positive place to be, but can also be quite unsettling to be across across classifications, perhaps, or or certainly, for example, in Hannah Hannah Wilkie's case, that that desire to go beyond the frame and to be both image and image maker got her many accusations of pure narcissism, for example, which you write about, or or vanity, or 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 very reductive criticism in the sense that I suppose the 70s were an expansive time, but also in many ways very, very narrow, narrow too. And and I'm interested in where this idea of across the sla uh, being across the slash came from, and also if you could talk maybe a bit more about the ambivalence of the art monster. Um, so the thing about the slash and this is maybe a good bit of craft talk or writing talk, um, it just came out that way. Like when I was drafting the early chapters of this book and just kind of like writing around and seeing where it was gonna go and like emptying my brain onto the page and you know searching for a thread, um, I just was writing in these short bursts and then putting a slash in between them and I don't know intellectually why I made that decision. I know that Flanus is less fragmented, but um, the different sections are offset with little crosses, which I saw as crossroads. Um, and so I, I, I am kind of conscious of what I'm choosing to put to say like new section now. Um, you could just have a space, I guess. Some people put a star or, or like a dash, but I was doing crosses and then I guess it ca that sort of carried over into slashes. But at a certain point, I had to be like, okay, what am I? Why am I using the slash? Why did I choose a slash and not some other, you know, way of indicating that it's a new section? Why is this fragmented? Um, what's happening here? And yeah, that I I have to read this very quick quote from Wolf because it kind of sums it up nicely. Um, so Wolf was in in the speech that kind of gave rise to a lot of this book, her 1931 professions for women speech. She begins by praising the composer Ethel Smythe um, for the groundbreaking work that she did as a woman in an industry dominated by men. Um, and so Wolf calls Ethel Smythe a blaster of rocks and the maker of bridges. So she says in that speech that in order for women to make their way in the world, it's necessary to destroy, but also to build, to fragment, but also to link. And I thought about it and I was like, that's what the slash is doing. That's really what fragmentation is. You know, if we take the fragments and we put them back together, um, you know, we're we're looking at an act that juxtaposes but also calls into question, um, that creates, you know, if you're looking at a mosaic or something, it creates an image, but it's also a very fractured image with a lot of movement. Um, and so I think with those slashes, I was trying to think about um, ways to open up spaces of ambiguity and to allow different things to exist at the same time. Um, and also just trying out, you know, a technique like would this work? Uh, it's a way of almost writing visually um, to sort of have a thing and then another thing and then another thing instead of a kind of narrative line. Um, but I obviously had to think about like, there's only so many things that you can take in when you're reading before you need to actually be told why you're being told these things. So it was a kind of constant balance between wanting to explore what the slash could do, but also having to, you know, keep in mind that this was a book that people had to read. You know, it's a it's a very different art to looking at a piece of art and then zooming in closer. That's really interesting. Um, the 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 desire for the book to have a visually striking form and which it really does, I think, n not, that is both legible but also visually quite arresting on the page and it makes me think about the monster and, and, and that alliance with the visual or not and I think too that your idea of the art monster is very much also textural um, when you write about Eve Sedgwick's texture with an XX, for example. Um, but also 
feeling and intuitive and with a focus on sensation, there's an amazing, th there's that amazing epigraph from Sarah Ahmed, feminism begins with, is it feminism begins with sensation? Yes. Um, and I, I do wonder about that common view of the monster as something that one sees first or is visually frightening and, and the passage that you read at the beginning was so interesting in, in showing and exposing some more positive kind of connotations of the monster as, as, as a figure of wonder, I suppose. But I think was that, was that Sedgwick kind of idea of texture something that was that that you wanted to deconstruct or or further in your in your in your in your discussion i think yeah i, yeah, I think i wanted to to deploy it yes. as they say and see what it could do um in this kind of context mm. <coughs> um there's that amazing image that's on the cover of Touching Feeling, which mm -hmm. is the Sedgwick book where she talks, she, she cites a graduate student of hers at Duke called Renu Bora, who wrote this amazing essay that she loved so much that she <laughs> wrote an essay about his essay. Um, and he writes about this idea of texture with two X's. So texture that tells you something from looking at it about the way it was made. Um, so, you know, for instance, Hannah Wilkie's sculptures that have like the imprint of her, her fingerprints on them. You can tell she kind of made them in one gesture. Um, you can see the, the kind of, you know, the lines of her thumb on them. Um, or even Chateau de you know, paper, uh, paper painting um, that she wants to, yeah, to bear like the imprint of its life in the world. Um, but yeah, and the, the Judith Scott image that's on the cover of Touching Feeling that she uses as a kind of example of texture with two X's is um, the artist Judith Scott who made a lot of really amazing um, kind of like textile based work, but it's it's really, they're these amazing kind of like, I don't, oblong things, uh, like she just found all these yarn and string and thread and whatever she could come across, she kind of wrapped and wrapped and wrapped and wrapped and wrapped. Um, she was born with Down syndrome and deaf and didn't speak and grew up most of her life in an asylum um, and then was kind of rescued by her twin sister who was, you know, neurotypical and had lived a kind of normal average life in, um, in Oakland, California. And then she went out to, to get her sister and brought her back and introduced her to this art center in Oakland. And that's where her sister just kind of started picking up bits of string and wrapping them around other things and kind of hiding things inside. Um, and so there's a, the picture that's on the cover of Touching Feeling that I'm talking about is of the artist hugging her art. And I find that painting, I mean that painting, that, that photograph like really emotional, like very um, kind of wonderful. It's like she, she just loves her art. Like she loves it so much she wants to give it a hug and she's just buried her face in it. And it's just, you know, I don't have that kind of unambivalent <laughs> relationship to my own work, um, but I, I love that she loved hers and I feel very moved by it. And f to me, it represented this possibility for art of like kind of re-aestheticizing the aesthetic, like bringing sensation back into art and mm -hmm. hugging it and touching it and bringing it close and making it like really tactile or um, the word that Eva Hesse uses is ucky. She said she wanted her work to be ucky. And Helen Chadwick is another artist who I write about in the book set would go like this when she was describing what she wanted for her work. And so, you know, you go like this and you know what I mean, like something really uh, kind of tacky and, and, and ucky, mm. you know? So yeah, uh, that also makes me think of sentimentality and your re your de your redeployment of that <laughs> term, and, and it's so often a dirty word, I think, in art criticism that we 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 can't we can't get sentimental over what we're viewing or writing about or or engaging with, and I thought that was really brave actually mm. that you um you tackled sentimentality mm. and and 
and didn't shy away from that in a sense. Because it might cloud our vision, right? <laughs> <laughs> we not might not be able to see straight because we're feeling things. <laughs> yeah, well, that's th it's 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 yeah. true. It is. It's again, we're a long way from that Kantian mm. distance, I think, yeah. and that kind of there is. I think the the body is certainly never a neutral mm. vessel, and um, and I and I think that the that idea of complete objectivity is 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 important to to expose mm -hmm. as as often as often quite fallible if not completely fictional mm. so i was i was happy fallible with a ph <laughs> 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 yes <laughs> <laughs> but for women i think it's important to be able to to say like you know we can we can we can do criticism without it being necessarily sentimental but we can also appropriate the idea of sentiment and and reclaim the fact that we feel things when we look at art and art makes us feel and that's not a bad thing. Um, we can talk about the aesthetics of a, a work that makes us feel things and whether it successfully does that or manipulatively does that or you know what have you. But um, the, the piece, well the, the artist who I ended up writing about in that section or just after it is Julia Margaret Cameron um, who was Wolf's great aunt, she's a great photographer, Victorian photographer, who took all of these kind of soft focus pictures of like children looking like angels or like women, you know, looking off into the distance um, and lots of like really amazing um, photographs of like old famous men with very craggy like faces. Um, I can't remember, is there one of Darwin maybe? That's the one I'm thinking of. Um, but she was just this amazing Victorian photographer. But at the time, she was not taken seriously by a lot of critics because she was a woman and because she wasn't trying to use the camera to make like perfect representations of reality. Um, she would like smudge the lens with her finger and then not clean it up. Um, or there'd be like bits of hair or dirt that would get in in the developing process and she'd leave it. And they were like, who is this amateur? Um, and she's like, no, I'm just, it's not that it's not reality. It's just another version of reality, a very tactile version of reality. And she, she was just, she was going for like a feeling, not for one-to-one, -one, you know, indexicality. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, that kind of idea about sentiment and the aesthetic, you know, she's someone who to this day is often dismissed because she made all these cute pictures of children. And it's like, well, why does a child does a child necessarily have to be something we're not interested in just because it's you know a, a kind of sent quote unquote sentimental idea? Like, what's wrong with sentiment? What's wrong with feeling things when we see a picture of a child? <laughs>